I find it interesting that as the series goes on, there's more and more painted backgrounds and like custom art. Yeah, because we haven't seen. Well, wait, was this in Route sixty five? This might have been around 65. I think it might have been. Because, like, I remember seeing little... I think I, I remember seeing, like, little Carl... Little baby Carl's face here. I sometimes feel like they slowly got more art that was available. But it just kind of surprises me they didn't go back and, like... Port some of it back into the original routes. You know what I mean? Yeah. the first routes have a lot of photos with filters on them. And that still happens, especially in the same locations, but some of them were sort of like slowly adding more and more unique art to the point where I think Route 65 was pretty much entirely paintings, but it was of the same setting that the rest of the stuff takes place in, so it's just kind of a surprise. Although maybe it's the daytime versus nighttime thing, like, I don't know. Because Route 65 took place pretty much entirely during the night. Well, it is an in like, it's really an interesting mix aesthetically. Like, I, I kind of like that every background is, like, a, it is, like, it's, it is varied, you know? And I, I don't really discredit it for that. I just actually think it's, like, visually interesting for that reason. Because then I can look at this and be like, oh, is it a photo? Is it a painting? And kind of, like, discern it as I'm looking at it. And it's, that's why it's, like, fun looking yeah. at the hotel room pictures and, like, figuring out if it's, like, an actual hotel room or not. <laughs> like, I don't mind that at all. I just feel like, like, the, like I don't know... This game was released in segments, or was it released all at once? Uh, definitely in segments, over the course of years. I, I feel like people would... Like, this is obviously very popular with a certain group of people, and I feel like people would be like, here, take my... I'll, I'll gladly do background art for free for this if you describe to me what you want to like have done. But there's definitely an element of fan artists that become... Uh, Involved. That become actual artists in the projects. But I, I know that c communicating what you need f for that and then also, like, I, th I think it could be complicated and using a photo would be much easier. But I definitely feel like people would donate art to this if given the opportunity. But I just want to work on it. I know that, um, because we saw the, I think, did we, do, I think we saw the kid versions of them during the flashback where uh, TJ and Carl were getting bullied or something. Yeah, and we also saw them in the f in their phone in the phone when we were uh, like as their little icons in, in Carl's in Carl's phone or his laptop. So those those are different. Those are uh, the ones on the phone oh, were I think a previous iteration okay, of a sprite okay. attempt. But I think we literally saw them as kids. Yeah, you're right. I, I, I forgot about that. You're right. Where Leo beats up Clint or something. Mm -hmm. uh, it might have been that might have been Clint and Jeremy, uh, but the uh, that was a fan video that that was just an uh, that was unrelated art made by a fan for like a music video thing, and then they were like for an OVA, and they, yeah, essentially, and then they, and they and then they ended up actually like arranging something to use it for the actual game. I don't know. I was gonna say hired or paid or. I have no idea. I don't know the, I don't know the logic. I don't, I don't know the, the inner workings of how this stuff works, but like this stuff does definitely happen. And there's definitely people that do fan art of these games regularly that then sometimes get worked into elements of the games themselves. Like I know that the Smoke Room has an alternate universe summer fan service spin-off game where the gang all goes to the beach or something. It's like a like like almost like a like an anime filler episode and it happens during <laughs> and it happens during modern day. And Horror Buns, this one artist that I know about, does uh, did all of the costumes for them, and you can like swap out their costumes because it's a fan service game, and it's but it's a different artist than the person who actually drew the characters in the first place. Yeah, but somebody was like good enough to like draw yeah. costumes that fit the characters, right? Yeah, just that kind of stuff just definitely just happens. See, ar like artist collaborations are great. The road turns back into chipped asphalt as we get closer to the old rail yard. The tracks to which, to which, the tracks to which run directly behind Leo and Duke's backyards. Not that they'd seen any use in decades. Most of the houses down the road are newer, and the county even installed a streetlight after an old badger lady got hit by a car five years ago. Oh. Well. That being said, most of the residences stand vacant now. In various states of disrepair. We haven't seen a badger yet. 
As we round a bend, I spot Leo's house down the way. It's a little ranch-style house with a big backyard, right off a dirt road leading off, leading from the street. It used to be his family's home before they moved out. No cop cars parked out front or anything. Not that I really expected there to be. Oh, cool Hello. art! Hello. Jenna slows for a moment, peering over her shoulder. This is really nice. Yeah, no, this is pretty. Yeah. Street light, light, street light art. Nice shadows. The, I, like the, the, I like the edges yeah, where they're the all, it's all scratchy. Yeah, it shows like the cracks in the grass and things. And just a reminder that they don't wear shoes. <laughs> and we get a we get a vague height reference for once. Yeah. You, you never you never see Chase in this game. Well, you know, I mean, you see we had that one group photo. Yeah. At the beginning. Yeah, there was the group photo, and then there was him swimming, but he's he's usually, like, out of frame. Well, we had, we had like, a discussion. Like, I remember me thinking that yeah. he was shorter. Yeah. Like, I, I, like there, there was a couple characters, so, I, like, I felt like I... Like, like him and Kuzu, I don't know if Kuzu... I, like, I felt like Kuzu was shorter than him. Kuzu's almost certainly shorter than Chase, I think. Yeah. Ch Kuzu might be shorter than Jenna. He's a short king. Yeah. <laughs> but the, uh... When I say you almost never ch see Chase, I mean like he doesn't have a his sprite doesn't appear normally, so you have to Except wait until he's, he's the CGs. Ghost. And there's like there's only seems to be like two or three CGs per route, and one of them's usually horror related. Mm -hmm. So like you get like a cut like we got Chase checking out Carl's belly and then cuddling with him on a beanbag. And yeah, then, and then there was evil Carl sheet picture. But yeah, I couldn't figure out if Carl or him was taller. That's what it was. Yeah, and then uh. Is, you only get to see him in these paintings, and they're usually done, all done by different artists, so it's even less consistent what Chase, like, exactly what Chase looks like. But these are really nice. How do you make stuff like this? Like the, the more I try to draw now, the more I'm like, I don't understand. The more I know, the less I know about how the fuck you even make these visually. It's wild to me. Painting's just wild. Her senses are better than mine, so I lessen my pace as well, trying to listen carefully. It's dead silent beyond the usual desert ambience. The rustle of breeze-swept trees, chirping crickets, and tweets from local night birds. I look back. I turn back to look at her. What? She frowns to herself. Nothing. Wait, did you hear something? She shakes her head, rubbing her wrist as she refocuses her attention back on me. No, just some unexpected nostalgia. I smile some, glad I'm not the only one. Oh? What for? I can't exactly place it. It's just a feeling. Almost sort of like what people call deja vu. Ah. I nod sagely, pretending to understand. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yes, I yes, see. Yes, I see. Astute observation. Uh -huh. I am listening, yes. She watches me for a moment, as if studying my features for something deeper. I watch her as well, the golden glow of the streetlight giving her fur a pale radiance, blurring her features into something warm and familiar. Her bushy tail sways, and I can see the light plumes of desert dust scatter away on the asphalt beneath. They dissipate into the air like a smoke, like smoke from a cigarette. It's, it's very. There's a noticeable shift in narration style, in that uh, McSkinny is very descriptive in the narration, and like sometimes he has like uh, these flights of fancy where he goes off and has like a metaphorical explanation of something, or like has a. I don't know how to, know how to put it. There's a uh, there's a very direct literalism to a lot of uh, Howley's. Uh, narration most of the time, mm -hmm. particularly noticeable in that Astra. And so when I was, uh, I'm, I'm contrasting it a bit because I was like, I had a scrapped chapter where I got into this a little bit, just trying to get into like the difference of writing style completely between each one. I'm like, and I'm, and I'm, I'm, on one hand, I'm like, it feels like it could be a criticism, but on the other hand, I'm like, is what is best for a visual novel? Like, was there an, an expectation of prose style and so on? Because there was just a, a tendency to dry, to just describe everything hyper literally. I fixated particularly on 
the scene where Marco walks in on Nefero dancing. Mm-hmm. And it specifically is designed to express the idea that Marco is confused and taking the scene in piece by piece to process what's happening. And in that context, another author would probably write in less literal terms to express confusion. But instead, we have a very specific and clear explanation of individual small parts of the scene that all collectively build to a clear scene eventually. So he takes it in piece by piece, but there's not like this, like, it's not like emotive writing exactly. I don't know how to, I don't know how to put it exactly because I'm not a, a, I'm not an English major, <laughs> so I don't know how to describe these things. Well, it's, it's more so just presented to Marco. Are you, are you trying to say it's like presented to Marco in the same way that it's presented to the audience as if like you and Marco are on the same page discovering what's happening as opposed to expressing feelings about it? Well, like, he definitely fixates on the knowledge of the character and how they're learning the thing, but it's different in that, like, I don't know how to express, it's hard to express the stuff. There's a way of communicating what a player is, what a character is experiencing <laughs> emotionally. And I don't mean like describing their emotions. I mean, having them perceive a scene emotionally. Yeah. As opposed to li- just describing what they're seeing and feeling in literal terms, like what they see in here. Well, with a situ- I mean, yeah. I mean, with a situation like with Marco just like walking out on Neferu, like I-, I feel like it's, I mean, I don't know if this was like an intentional choice or not, but it- I feel like like sometimes it's just like you describe what's happening and you leave it to the audience to parse out how they should perceive Marco to feel about it. Like... I mean, then there are some writings that like to, like, not, like, shoehorn or anything, but, like, to give... I'm obviously not an English major either. (laughs) uh, To give, like, basically to say, like, like, this is how you should be feeling because this is how the... The protagonist is feeling like I'm gonna. Yeah, imp- I'm, not, I'm gonna imply I'm not, more I'm emotion. Commu- I'm not communicating very well because I'm not. I don't mean whether or not they tell you how to feel about the scene. I mean like there is a way of expressing. I don't. I don't know how to call. The, I don't know how to call this stuff. I just there's a way of ex- of experiencing a like like when you express that a person is overwhelmed by what they're walking in on there's a way that you would express it via a series of individual the <laughs> it's so fucking hard to talk about this stuff all i can say is that i was tempted to i was so tempted to rewrite the scene that i li- literally did i rewrote the scene and then i scrapped the entire project cuz i'm like i'm not putting this stuff in the essay but i was like i was just like so and obviously i like Ad Astra a lot but uh, there's elements of the specific narration style where i'm like there could you could do more with some of this stuff and i wanted to like i said so i sat there and rewrote uh marco's internal monologue for the entire for that scene just to try to express what i was trying to get at and me trying to bring this up is just really clumsy here and it's hard to get into it without just actually getting into it verbatim but and comparing scenes directly i mean i think i vaguely understand but i'm just trying to express the fact that i'm very 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 much noticing the change in narration style between the two writers it's extremely it's it's it's, it is not it's like it's mixed because i'm like i I like what i like what mcskinney is doing but also it could almost be seen as a criticism how noticeable it is that the writers changed (laughs) and not just because he started using discombobulate sometimes but like because he uh the entire style of Chase's narration inter- nar- uh, monologue has changed in its style of descriptiveness and so on. Yeah, yeah. And obviously it's hard to keep that consistent between two writers. Yeah, uh, but I've, it, just, it, I've just completely fumbled trying to discuss it. It's, it's it's a little bit complicated because this is like a visual novel. And honestly, I don't know how I would write a visual novel. Like, I, feel, I mean, and granted, there are like points of like, there are points where you can be strangely descriptive. But then there are, there are points where you just need to literally convey what is happening for the sake of, like, the pacing of the story. So you need, like, a balance of these two things. But when yeah. it comes to, like, when I read novels, it's like, I like flowery, elaborate writing, which is why, like, like you know, like, I always think of, like, Hemingway is, like, kind of the antithesis of what I usually like because it's so, um, I mean, not all the time. I like him some of the time. But there's, like, there's, like, a straightforwardness 
and like a this is what's happening there might be like an implication to what i'm saying that you can elaborate on in your brain but i'm not gonna at all give you anything here like this is what is happening this 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 and this you take it how you think it should be taken i mean a bunch of other things but i'm not gonna at all describe them to you and i'm not saying that like i don't think that that's lazy at all and i don't think that the people who read books with flowery overly drawn out descriptions like i read are lazy for not like being able to infer these things themselves i just i just tend to like writing that's a little bit more uh like like lyrical and like pretty i don't know i'm just one of those people but I like poetic it even goes writing. Both ways, like a, a poetical, a poetical explanation of something often obscures meaning to some extent, and that it makes the scene harder to understand literally. But it conveys emotion and gives you a subjective understanding of the person of the protagonist. Like it gives you the protagonist's subjective understanding of what's happening instead of the literal exact things that are just are happening and are seeing and there's just ways of handling that i just think i under i understand that language more as weird as that sounds like emotional language i it like translates better to me as opposed to like yeah like ernest hemingway like the sun also rises made me pissed off because like the guy definitely has like he definitely has a dick injury but they never talk about it <laughs> yeah no because he, he was he was in the war and there's a reason he can't be with this girl and like there's this whole thing about it and he never specifically says it and I, you can say it's a commentary on ernest hemingway and his perception of manhood and how he's not going to elaborate on this guy's definite dick injury but damn the whole fucking book i was like can you please just verify the dick injury because it's definitely a dick injury right like you know but granted that book has one of the, my favorite last lines ever so it's like 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 i like like i said there's there's ups and downs to these things i just i like the my favorite book is 100 Years of Solitude, so that should tell you everything. Like, the, like the last sentence of that book, I want to say, is, like, a whole page long. This last sentence is, like, almost a whole page. It is fucking elaborate. It tells you everything, if you have any idea what she's talking about. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it, it does if you've ever had to read these books in English, which is... It's sad that my favorite book's just an English lit class that you probably got forced to read, but, like, it's honestly fucking great, so... Mm. Well, I mean, yeah, it's, that's... School has a magic ability to wring all of the fun out of things that you would otherwise enjoy. Great Gatsby is a great book too. Yeah, genuinely, most, most books you read and most books you read in school are pretty good. It's just that they make them awful. I don't know, man. I had to read some shitty books in school. Oh, I hated, I hated Scarlet Letter. Oh, okay. I like Scarlet Letter, but that's because <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm a hoe, and so I was like, I relate to this character being shamed <laughs> for her thoughtiness. But no, those things I liked about that book, and also I liked the weird demon imagery with her daughter. So, but anyways, sorry. Yeah. When we were uh, when we were younger, we had many nights like this, walking to and from Leo's place. Most of the time, we'd be chatting about video games we'd been playing or some manga that Jen had gotten into. Looking back, I could tell she savored those times, the fleeting moments she had away from home where she could express her passions without fear of judgment or ridicule. Well, occasionally that'd be ridicule, but of the good faith sort, I think. Friendly teasing. Whenever she criticized some dumb thing I said or weird ass phase I was going through, it never felt like she was like she thought lesser of me. Like the soul patch. She sh she suffered through my late 2000s frosted tip highlights scene phase after all. Oh goodness. <laughs> oh, that sentence kept going. She just she was just was trying to encourage me to be a better person. Those long walk-in talks we had were like ways to gauge your own small town induced insanity. It was during those times I felt more secure in myself than I ever did elsewhere. But it's also when I, well, we understood we truly didn't really belong here. I can't help but wonder if that's what she's thinking of now. She smiles once, then picks up the pace again. I step up and match her speed. I hope Duke still works late shifts. I recall him being quite nocturnal when we were growing up. He works at the Blue Diamond Casino by the reservation, right? Mm-hmm. As far as I remember. 
I used to think that only native people could get jobs there. I know they try to keep it that way, but many of the locals in the res lack the skill sets and training for some of the jobs. Hence the outsourcing. I think Duke works, or at least worked, as a security technician. Huh. I guess I didn't know him that well. Me neither. But he was friends with my father. Hmm. I can see Duke's house now. A large, manufactured home that's raised up like three feet off the ground. Her father, who had a lot of access to drugs, incidentally. Yeah, apparently. I think Flynn told me once they made him raise it up since it sat in a flood zone for the nearby wash. Said wash pretty much never had water in it, except for one particular monsoon season, where a flash flood sent white water currents down it. How does one even raise a house? It all drains out into Lake Emma. Wait. They asked him to raise it. He had to raise his house up three feet off the ground. But it also has a basement? Oh, yeah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> There's a hole. Is, I don't... I mean, I don't know how this works. No, you, I don't think you can have can a basement. Can you also have a no. basement when you're in a raised house? I don't think so. I mean, how does I mean, that work? Tell us in the comments, guys. Yeah. Well, but tell honestly, us, I get the... Tell us that lore of house construction. I, I don't feel fucking... like it's it's uh, it's uh, connected, so I don't think you can do that. Because wasn't it Duke's house that had the, the prepper's basement that they kept uh, Leo in? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that was Duke's house. Yeah, because... Uh, right, because we were at Brian's house beforehand. Yeah. Huh. I don't know. <laughs> it all drains out into Lake Emma. It's difficult to see in the dark, but the house looks to be in a bit of a sorry state. The yard is overgrown with tall weeds, and there's a bunch of striped bicycle parts and other electronic components strewn about. Jenna sees it too and lets out an audible hum, as if acknowledging some confirmed suspicion. I'm about to ask her what she's uh, what's up when she speaks again. You know, my grandma never left the reservation, no matter how bad it got down there. I used to visit her a lot before she got sick. Oh? There's something about the tone in her voice that makes me think I should stop walking. I turn and focus on her. Hmm. I don't believe any of you guys ever met her. She was probably the most down-to-earth member of my family, despite genuinely believing in a lot of the old spiritual aspects of the Maseta culture. Like rain dances? Jenna gives me a look that makes me immediately regret speaking, my tail curling instinctively. You're thinking of the Pascawa tribe. They're the ones that did the dancing around the bonfire bit that gets attributed to every native culture for some reason. Right. My bad. I gave her a little thumbs up of understanding. So I guess that was them and Carl's route. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, what the fuck? <laughs> like... we, did, we did have a dancing around a fire scene before. I, mu I must look especially scorned because Jenna begins to snicker a little. She reaches over, pushing my thumb down and squeezing my fist. Her grasp is incredibly soft, and I feel myself longing for it again as she lets go. Hey... You're a college education. You're a college edu educated journalist now. You can't get away with the cute ignorance anymore. I've got one more le year left of that, actually. I say with a faux defensive tone. I guess I should hold on to staying cute as long as I can. Oh, that's easy, Chase. All you have to do is lose the goatee. <laughs> Hell yes! Everyone's yes, going yes, after yes, 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 yes. I agree. <laughs> what? Oh, come on. Yeah, it's it's funny because it, it's a uh, Chase talks about all of his phases and choices as like a past thing. Like, oh, I'm done with all those dumb childhood choices and my frosted tips and my old my my scene phase and my my manga. And then here he is in the middle of another phase, just because we always are. We're always in the middle of yet another thing, and <laughs> the, your life just keeps being these eras until they're over. Yeah, and honestly, like you, you be like an old person in like a phase, be like a like one of those old ladies. Your midlife crisis. The red hat society ladies. They wear the red hats. You ever seen those ladies before? 
The Red Hat Society. I don't know if that's still around. Yeah, the Red Hat Society was like a, a congregation of old ladies that wear like red hats with purple feathers in them, and they go drink tea together and gossip. Like the what? bad bitches they are. What? Yeah, no, th- that was like a popular thing back like when I was a kid. It's probably like the two- 2000s. My aunt used to run a store that like was frequented very commonly by older ladies because it was like it was like a knickknack kind of shop, and they were fucking everywhere. There was a ton of them. Weird. Occasionally, I still see a red hat society lady. I think like where? Why else would you have a red hat with a purple feather in it? I don't know. That's that's so specific. Is, is that is that just local to me? Also, I don't know. other I question no for the audience: about. Does anyone else know what I'm talking about, or is it just like <laughs> this area of California? It just it feels like we're talking about like oh yeah they had like a, a cult there was like alternative people there's like the punk kids and the metal the red kids hat the goth society. kids there's that part where a bunch of old ladies wear red hats with purple feathers <laughs> and that's it well, <laughs> I, I'm just saying phases are forever okay you be an old man into like making a like, I just, it's I making like, train models or like something some cultures usually have more of like a range to them and a freedom of like of expression and then this one, just this hat that's the whole thing <laughs> we, we just sit around and gossip about each other and hate on each other and talk smack about other old ladies with red hats like it's, you're in the club now <laughs> oh god i reach up and grab the dyed piece of facial scruff and a bubbling sense of self-consciousness burns on at my cheeks she just dyed like a triangle like <laughs> yeah because he can't like grow is, 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 a is there a stencil like how do you do this yeah like he had to like dye a piece to look like like human facial hair essentially oh no jenna laughs some more I'm just kidding. I know Leo isn't a fan of it, though. He told me as much. I let out a bit of a deflated noise. For some reason, that also kind of stings. He's supposed to think I'm hot no matter what. No matter what. Jenna waves dismissively, trying to get back to what she was saying. She seems serious about getting what she has to say off her chest. Anyway, Grandma had all this ham radio equipment in her house. She started collecting it after Grandpa died, which was long before I was born. She was really into technology and broadcasting, which admittedly was an oddball contrast from her more spiritual, tradition-based outlook on life. She crosses her arms, taking a glance inside of an old parked pickup truck that's missing its plates on the side of the road. I shine my phone's flashlight inside, but there's just a bunch of bags of what Looks like farming stuff, mainly fertilizer. I remember thinking it was neat. She used to sit on her porch with her quilting gear and talk on the radio to passing truckers. That's wow. really that's pretty really? cool, actually. That's pretty dope. I start to picture an old native woman who looks like Jenna, knitting needles in one paw and a radio mic in the other. It's gonna be difficult. You really need both hands for that. Yeah, I was gonna. Yeah, you can't one hand the needling. Yeah, you can't. <laughs> why? <laughs> why you'd have to be like one of those people that could like spin chopsticks? Like, yeah. yeah, her radio had pretty good range. She did this for years. Got kind of a reputation because of it. Sweetheart of Echo Valley, or something along those lines. Oh, huh. she was like flirting with that. I was gonna say, I, I'm guaranteed. Like, if there's some girl, on the, like some lady on the radio, yeah. they're like. Keeping truckers lonely on long, cold nights. They're like, hey, honey, where are you? Like, can I come visit? (laughs) Jenna smirks, lightly shrugging her shoulders. Well, I suppose there was probably some of that. I remember Adam mentioning that occasionally she would find flowers in her post box. Sometimes even letters. Grandma was pretty shy, actually. It didn't like how she looked. When she was born, her ears and parts of her scalp were malformed. It was as... It was at some underfunded tribal clinic up north, so they weren't equipped to fix it. Didn't get the money for that and later later in life, either. She brings her paws up to her own ears, running her fingers down them to the base of her head fur. She always wanted to wear these big sun hats whenever she went somewhere, like she didn't feel right being seen. But over the radio, she would mainly just talk to these truck drivers, ask them about their day, about things that made them happy. And I remember hearing about this one particular time, where she talked with the truck driver who had recently lost his wife in an accident. Naturally, he was very upset and was considering whether life was worth living anymore. So Grandma told him to pull over and come visit her. He was reluctant at first, but he did. Grandma got together all the other old neighbor ladies and rolled up this big ancient girl from the 60s. They were all wearing red hats. Exactly. Purple feathers. (laughs) They baked a bunch 
It baked a bunch of fry bread, a bunch of probably a bunch of fry bread, and cooked up a ton of tacos. She even went out and personally got the ingredients to make some homemade cookies, since he mentioned he liked those over the radio. When he got there, she taught him how to make all the food himself. Oh, that's really cute. She was worried about she was worried without a wife, he wouldn't know how to cook something decent on his own. She also went around and introduced him to everyone, treated him like he was a guest of honor. He was this little rat guy, really meek. Little rat trucker. I want to see a rat trucker. At first, he was worried he was being awkward and was out of place, but they talked for hours and hours, way into the night. His wife and him had been together for 18 years, and she was an art teacher at an elementary school in two canyons. So before he left, she and him made a sand painting. A sand painting? I'm reluctant to interrupt, but I've never heard of that before. It's a painting in sand, usually done with pigments. What's interesting is... They're not really art objects. They're for helping people heal to become better. Once painted, the person who needs the healing would sit in the center of the painting. The energy and goodwill that was put into the painting was to help the person in need, healing spirits and that sort of thing. I know nowadays you mainly see them framed up on roadside craft sales. Oh, but that's what they were originally for. <laughs> that hurts me to read. <laughs> so <laughs> Commodities. Jenna trails off, and I look away as she clears her throat. She takes a slow breath, and it takes her just a second to continue. My parents weren't there at Grandma's funeral. It was at some public meeting building out in Peyton for some reason. For my family, it was just Adam and I. Adam? Really? Yes. This was a long time ago before you started changing. We were nearly a third of the way through the service when the rack guy shows up. And I have to ask Adam who he is. The only people up there, oh, the only people there up to, to that point were us foxes. After that, I started noticing more non foxes coming in. Some were literally wearing those stereotypical trucker hats with the holy bits in the back. And of course, half of the people were really confused who these guys were. Like maybe they were at the wrong funeral. They just sat in the back, and then Adam went up to speak. She folds her arms tighter across her chest, smiling to herself as her gaze flicks upward. Adam stuttered his way through the speech, but at the end of it, he started inviting up the new arrivals in the back. A lot of them were fairly gruff-looking guys, you know? And one by one, they get up and start reading letters. She pauses again. Letters thanking her for being so kind, for giving them someone to talk to about their problems, or just being so witty and fun to speak to. They're her old-timey internet friends. Yeah, back before the internet. The rat guy, God, I wish I remembered his name, went a blast and his letter addressed Grandma like she was still there with us. He talked about how he was doing, how tough things were after what happened. He mentioned his wife by name about how losing someone so good and special can make it feel like the world had become so much darker. But... How it's always important to remember that there are still good people out there, even if they're just someone who can lend an ear for a while. And it felt like he was actually talking to us about Grandma. I thought about that a lot when, you know, Adam passed. About how maybe it wasn't just a chemical imbalance, and perhaps he just needs someone to talk to. This is the first time we, we've heard about that, right? I think so. I don't, th I don't I think, think we it's... Knew that, I think we knew that Adam was dead. I don't think we knew Adam was dead. Hmm. Because when, when, when we told Chase that we wouldn't... Like, oh, the people that we would go visit, it's like... Basically, it was like, oh, I'd I would not visit my parents. I wouldn't even visit Adam. And and we responded to that in like a way that seemed surprised. Which makes me think that we knew Adam was dead, but not you and I thought knew Adam was dead. As an audience member. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have that specific of a memory of that scene. Because that was all the way back in the hiking trip. Yeah. When she brought the stuff up. I think it's, I honestly think this is the first time we realized Adam was dead. The handy thing is when you have a book, you can just flip back to the I page know. really easily. I know. You can kind of get back there a little bit, but because of the nature of the fast-forward feature, it's really hard to actually spot the correct moment. Like we, did, like we tr tried to do with the Brian scene. Mm -hmm. We're like, where the fuck was this? And you're like... You're like she, she keeps her arms still tight over her torso, though it looks more now like a self-bracing measure. A far cry from her usual standoffish posturing. 
I also thought about how you're so goddamn alone out here. She gestures with both, ar both arms to her surroundings. I peer down at myself, then back at Jenna. She lets out a little noise that sounds like a quick sigh before shaking her head. Not you specifically, but rather anyone stuck in this place. What is it with Echo and taking away all that's good? She's looking at me now, but I might as well be a brick wall for how equipped I am to answer that question. It feels almost rhetorical in nature, something with so many reasons that you could, uh, that you could apply, that it becomes simply too much to try to put into words. I sheepishly hold up my arm. Would it be too patronizing? Too much of the stereotypical guy thing to reach out to her now? No, anyone, like, anyone should do this for somebody who's being vulnerable. It's a moment of vulnerability from someone who's cultivated a life worth of being invulnerable. I suppose we've all got heavy shit under the surface. Jenna probably most of all. And while some of us sort of downplay it with jokes, self-depreciation, or lashing out at others, Jenna's always kept it under said surface. Seeing this all brought to life feels like something raw, uncomfortable, something understood to be immovable being moved. I look past Jenna to the wash, like the desert flooding. I... I exhale, looking back down to her. I can feel my mind going blank, like it did earlier. See, that's a, that's, a, that's a good example of what I was going for. <laughs> the jet, what I was gesturing at before in the writing, and like, he specifically themed the description of the environment to foreshadow the reveal that was about to happen, and then connecting them back together. Like this, like this rare vulnerability is like the desert flooding. When we introduced the Duke's house being raised for the flood. The question is whether that has okay. continuity with the setting or not, but <laughs> like, like there's a specific, like there's a specific specificity to how the soul is expressed. Yeah, really like just like yeah, I guess there's there's more of a descriptiveness to this in terms of yeah, in terms of people's body language and in terms of scenery. Like I said, both styles of writing are still valuable. Yeah. It just depends on what you kind of prefer. And it's I know like people, I know people that perspectiveness that was not compatible with Howley's writing style from what most of what I remember. But I know I know people that hate that. I know people that hate if, if it takes well, longer to say him. No like like, <laughs> like 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 I love I love my dad very much. But he but he hates if something takes more than like a page to describe. But I'm like I'm like but it's like something really important and like I feel like that can take I, I'm not saying take eight pages to describe no. the house or anything but I'm like like, like no, take I'm, I, I, a page I can, be, I can be the person that's like why is the description of the feast taking this long George R. R. Martin uh, why do I need to know every <laughs> food that's being served uh, this is a bit much I was gonna make a American Psycho reference but I yeah. think all, all that over elaborate description of stupid things like Tina Turner's a great album and how yeah. it might write a whole chapter about how great Tina Turner is is really important to understanding that he's a psychopath so I'm yeah. not going to criticize that but you can do such interesting stuff with it sometimes it's like the equivalent of like realizing that in the movie Annihilation the house that they take shelter in uh, near the end of the film is the same house that the movie that is all the, all the flashbacks yeah, I know you, you pointed that out, it's and just, honestly, I didn't even catch it when it's we were such watching a, it's it. It's such a bizarre detail. You're like, what the fuck? <laughs> like they have a, they specifically have a scene where she's, they have a scene where Kane arrives at home, uh, out of nowhere, uh, in the flashbacks. Like the husband arrives at home mm -hmm. and is standing in the entryway, and it shows a shot of the bottom floor from behind him. And then you see, and then you when uh, during the scene in, in modern day where they're in that other house. You get the exact same shot, basically. And it's like, oh, okay. And I think they even have an establishing shot of the outside of the house or something. Like It's just a trip. And it's like, it's not literal, obviously. Just like how the flooding, like, uh, Duke's house being raised is not tied to Jenna's backstory. <laughs> like, these are not related to each other. No, no, no. Literally, but, but, it adds but they are to the related tone. to each other emotionally. Yeah, yeah. So just like you should not read into in Annihilation, the idea that it's literally the same house, because that's definitely not the plot. <laughs> that's, no, it's no, not, no. It's, but, but it's doing something with that. Which is spoilers. But 
I mean, that's not, that's not really a spoiler, because honestly, like I said, I watched that. I did not catch no, that. No, pointing it out is not spoilers. I'm saying elaborating on it is spoilers. Oh, yeah, d d don't spoil movies for people, Keith. I... I exhale, looking back down to her. I could feel my mind going blank like it did earlier. Her expression's indiscernible, but she's still looking at me. Ooh, uh oh. Wow, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot more little choices in here. Yeah, definitely save. There we go. This is the first time we've had three choices, I think. Uh, besides the time where we had five choices, but that was the routes. Well, I mean, yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't really count that. I don't know how to answer that. We kept each other sane. The town, this town breaks people. I feel like we should do the middle one, because I feel like I don't know how to answer that as a cop out. I feel like the town breaks people is negative. I feel like we kept each other sane is like a nice. I feel yeah. like that's gonna progress our relationship, which is like the what, last what I'm voting for, because Jenna's a cutie, but also like I think it's a nice thing to say to somebody who needs reassurance. The last two are complementary halves to the same observation, in a way. Yeah. You're essentially choosing which part to talk about. Well, the but they both are true at the same time. Yeah, but the the first one, obviously, the first one's completely out because it's just like yeah. I, I'm being, I'm like I'm I like oh, I don't know what to say. But like the second and third one are both saying similar things. It's just that one is like making it a point to credit. So this is the actual thing we're responding to, to be clear, because it's been a bit. Oh yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely understand. It's just that like the second one is like the second one and the third one both say similar things because it, it it they both infer that Echo is a really negative place to live. But the first one gives gives Jenna credit. The last one's like for commiserating, helping. and the middle one is like like is like uniting. Yeah, well, it is. Yeah. It's is it's like I think it's uh, more helpful for pacifying, but also it's like we did good things together. Like I'm giving you credit. It's like it's like it's like you might as well throw a compliment in there if you're gonna say shit about your town that you live in. Yeah. I was really fortunate growing up. I had a boyfriend I loved, a group of friends who supported me, and a family who gave a shit. And I'm not like the world's most mentally healthy person, you know? I see a completely alternate timeline where I'm just like the rest of those guys in Tetanus Alley or worse. I rubbed the back of my neck sheepishly. I'm not good at making these reassuring speeches, but this is all stuff I've admittedly thought about before. That rat guy was right. Having someone around who gives a damn means the world. And isolating yourself from said world isn't how you make yourself better. It's the opposite. And for keeping me sane, I do think I kind of have to thank you for that, in some part. My voice cracks, and I try to cover it with a cough. Smooth. Thank you, Chase. Jenna smiles lightly. That's actually rather beautiful. Has this been on your mind for a while? I shrug. Lately, at least. Well, I like to think that this... That his and your sentiments are true. If we have time, I might stop by to see Jeremy. When I talked to him, he sounded like he wouldn't mind seeing you again. Jenna chuckles briefly. <laughs> it's strange. It's strange, isn't it? <laughs> it's strange, isn't it? <laughs> it's strange, isn't it? The notion of you talking to him now as adults. As kids, we were all so at odds over truly stupid things. I suppose I'm curious whether he's grown up as well. I guess we'll see. Yeah, I don't know. That feels like a response to a previous conversation. Like, I kind of... I. It kind of seems like maybe Jeremy was the one he, that she didn't want to visit, and Adam was the one she would have visited, or something. Did I fuck that I don't up? Know, it's hard to check. For some reason, I thought it was Jeremy because they, they they acknowledge that Jeremy was the one that picked on us, and she's like, he, he, and like Chase is like, even though Jeremy was like a dick to us growing up and all this shit about him dealing drugs and all this stuff, and she mentions how like and she feels like her you parents. Might, cause you also might be thinking of like, they might have been talking about Adam having changed. Well, whatever they, happened with Adam, and so he might have been he might have been talking about that. Well, they talk about like uh, Jeremy know. being a drug dealer, which I, which is very specifically his thing and not Adam's thing. Yeah, but I don't know if that was the specific recourse of him being surprised. I don't know. <laughs> the only way to know is to check manually. Jenna raises a brow. Maybe. I mean, all this being said, I'm not 
truly excited to go back and talk to him or his friends. For Jenna's sake, I can grin and bear it, though. Not even the cute bat? <laughs> the bat. The conspicuous bat character was introduced with a sprite and everything that definitely doesn't come up again? Yeah, never again. I guess I have to ask, what makes you think of this? What made you think of this? I mean, the story about your grandmother. Was it just talking about tech stuff and the reservation? Jenna ponders this question for a moment, looking a bit more like her usual self. However, there's a still a, there's still a slight unnerving tinge to her, like her tail has an extra bit of bristle to it. I suppose that's what got me talking about her. Though I started thinking about this all earlier. Oh. Up ahead, the screen door on the side of Duke's house flings open. A, fami a familiar ash-colored figure peers out, attention focused on us. What are you two doing? He calls out to us, having a shout since having to shout since we're nearly three properties down. Uh, he's he's figuring us first. Well, he found us. Yeah, I guess our voices carry. <laughs> I was gonna say like like were we talking loud? Like <laughs> yeah, I guess it's just in the silence. There's nothing happening this late. So it's like there's a crickets outside. Yeah. Sometimes I just feel rude for talking outside ever that night. I mean, I don't know. I've sat on the curb outside our house and just talked, but not like loud. You. I know. Yeah. Like evicted immediately. <laughs> Keith's like, I heard you out there talking <laughs> at night. I know all of your secrets. Ho, 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 ho. I'm on the opposite side of the house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At Pueblo, I'd cringe at the idea of someone shouting out this late in a neighborhood. We weren't shouting, though. No, they were. He did. Oh, 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 oh. oh However, uh, most of these houses are long since abandoned. Jenna and I exchange a look before making our way closer to respond. The lanky weasel is certainly looking rougher around the edges than I remember. The old man taking slow steps into an overgrown front yard. Of course, he's got his gun on him, his paw gingerly clutching it while the other brandishes a cigarette. Or at least, I think it's a cigarette. <laughs> Real late for a stroll. He mumbles. Duke? Hi, good morning. It's Jenna. Okay, I like Duke Sprite. His pants are looking weird. <laughs> yeah, I know you're right. His pants are looking like he's currently sitting in a saddle. Like there's like they're stretched upward, like they're being pushed upward. I'm like, that's very odd. I don't think uh I, I never behind. I never looked past the text bar. So. Yeah, it hides behind the text, but I'm like, I actually like how Duke looks in general. Like I think he's well drawn, but I'm like, those pants are did, something's going on there's with those pants. Yeah, there's something going on there. He, some, he's got a fat thigh gap, which <laughs> It just it looks like he just got kicked. He's getting kicked right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, by <a> ghost. <laughs> yeah. Is that Chase with you? I hold up my paw and wave. Hi. Hmm, it is. Duke takes a drag from the fat cigarette, and I see some embers fling around him as he taps the end. In my mind, I imagine one of those little specks of fire catching up, catching on the untrimmed grass beneath, setting everything ablaze. I knew it. What Leo has been saying is true. He was seeing shit as well. Confronted him about it, and he got a wild look in his eyes. Pushed me to the dirt. But here you are, in the flesh, and talking this time. I give him a befuddled look. What's he talking about? Well, Leo's going through a bit of a rough time, and that's certainly no excuse for the violence he imposed against you. She's so diplomatic all the time. <laughs> However, we did see you at Carl's house, and you might have heard that he's gone missing. Hmm. What good timing for your arrival, then, Jasmine. It's Jenna now, but that's beside the point. His bloodshot eyes shift from me to her. And that makes me even more uneasy. Have you seen Carl since last night? Duke clicks his tongue, shaking his head more times than he really needs to. I don't think you're investigating the right mystery here. <laughs> Jenna raises an eyebrow. 
He points a swollen pink finger in my direction, still looking at Jenna. The real question is, why has your friend here been snooping around our houses here for the past month? What? Jenna furrows her brow, a light sigh escaping from between her lips. I don't know what... I feel her hand discreetly reach over and squeeze my side. Hold on, Chase. She mutters, refocusing her attention back on the weasel. Duke, please focus on me for a moment. Listen to the words I am saying. Have you seen Carl since last night? Duke hangs his maw open, rolling his jaw around from side to side until there's an audible click as it locks into place. I don't think you're hearing me. I heard you, Duke. Please, a yes or no answer, and then we can discuss what you saw with Chase here. Duke's bloodshot gaze flicks back to me, and there's something expectant about the look in his eyes, like he's waiting for me to say something revelatory. I have no clue what he's talking about, though, and Jenna doesn't seem to want to give him an inch of leeway to change the topic of conversation. Hmm. I see his teeth grit past his thin lips. Despite the intensity he's putting off, he looks kind of distracted. Like, we're only getting about three-fourths of his attention. Maybe it wasn't quite you, though, was it? His voice is strained and quiet. The weasel scratches his inner thigh. I didn't see the ram boy, or his little rich parents. Is he still holding the gun? I think he just, he's, he gen, he's gingerly touching it this whole time, I think. Like, is it on a holster, or is he hold? Because I think he's just, they just said t- holding. I'm like, is he holding a gun in one hand and a cigarette in the other one? And then he was, is, is he scratching his inner thigh with the gun, gun hand? <laughs> like, it prob- what an awkward I'm, maneuver. Probably, but like, I, I, I don't think, I, I don't think he has a holster. I don't think he's, <laughs> these, these people out here don't have holsters, as Leo just has a gun on his bedside table. Yeah. These people just put them in their front pockets yeah just st- just stick it in the front of his fucking pants in the belt yeah just stick it in your jeans okay thank you chase oh uh i only got here on saturday i wasn't here before then there's only really one other otter in town as far as i know and he probably weighs 150 pounds more than me so i don't really know who else it could be Duke just glares in response to that, and I can't help but drift my gaze to the gun he's holding so idly in his grasp. Pimp just scratches inner thigh with the gun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, uh, <laughs> I guess he, I guess he could have put the cigarette in his mouth. Yeah, while this, he did yeah, that, yeah, that yeah, makes yeah. more sense. <laughs> I think he notices as I see his finger clench around the base a little tighter. Okay, thank you, Duke. It's really good to see you again. If you have time, keep an eye out for him, okay? We can't seem to track him down. He's right there. Look at the expression change. Uh-oh. Who? Is it, talking about Carl? Is Carl right there? He points to okay. me. Okay. Uh, no, I'm referring to Carl. Carl's not here. Right. We're gonna go look around some more and knock on a few doors once the sun's up. You take care, all right? Before I can so much as raise my paw and farewell, Jenna's already turned around and making her way down the street. Again, I have to hustle to catch up. Yeah, you better leave. Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> Out! Out! Out!